For today's lesson, we're going to see how to take a chemical formula like these and turn them into a word instead. Like what would you call this CaCl2 or what would you call this LiNO3? To do this, there's a little accompanying flowchart that you should have in your little note sheet that you could download um, that has different scenarios of how to name something. There's one set of rules for ionic compounds. There's a different set of rules for covalent compounds. Remember, ionic compounds are ones made up of a metal with a nonmetal. Because the, the majority of the periodic table are metals, there's a lot more combinations that you can come up with for metals with nonmetals. The covalent ones are just the nonmetals only, and they have a different set of rules. So we're going to look at just the ionic compounds to start. For the way you name an ionic compound, varies depending on where the metal is from. If the metal is from family 1a, 2a, or 3a on the periodic table, the first three columns, all you have to do is write the metal's name. So if you had something like K, you would write the word potassium. Or if you had Mg, you'd write the word magnesium. If your metal's a transition metal in the middle of the periodic table, then you're going to need some additional information, and we'll see an example of those. The nonmetal portion, you look and see if it's one type of element or more than one type of element. If it's just one type of element, like you just see Br or Cl2, yes, there's two atoms of chlorine there, but they're all chlorine, then you chop off the ending of the element name and put IDE instead. If it's more than one type of element, you see phosphorus and oxygen, or oxygen and hydrogen, then you should have a chart sheet, something like this, that you would be able to look up whatever that's called and write down the name of it. So the first example we're going to do is this CaCl2. We have to find out where calcium is. Because calcium is in the 2A family, all we have to do is write the word calcium. Well, now we're on to the nonmetal portion of the periodic, of this uh, compound here. So Cl2, yes, there's two chlorines, but they're all chlorine. When it's only one type of element, you chop off the ending of the element's name and replace it with an IDE. So this would be calcium chloride. A lot of people, when they first start naming compounds, worry, how would someone know that there's two chlorines there, unless I say something like dichloride. Be careful not to add prefixes when they're not necessary. If you had the words calcium chloride, you could figure out that there were two chlorines there because calcium has a charge of plus two. Chloride has a charge of minus two. Minus one, sorry. So plus two minus one, it would make the formula CaCl2. It's not necessary to say dichloride. Someone would be able to figure out that there's two chlorides there just by the fact that you're balancing out charges. For this next one, we have LiNO3. Li is in the first column on the periodic table. So all we have to do is write what Li is called, lithium. Now we go on to the second part, the nonmetal portion. The nonmetal portion is made up of more than one type of element. We've got nitrogen and oxygen there, so we would have to look up what NO3 is called. You could find NO3 about halfway down on your charge sheet on the right hand side. NO3 is called nitrate. So the name of this compound is lithium nitrate. Our next one, CaClO32. We have Ca, calcium is from the second column on the periodic table, so we just have to write the word calcium. ClO32, well, there's more than one type of element there, so we'd have to find ClO3 on our charge sheet here. ClO3 is up near the top. The name of that ion is called chlorate. Again, there's no need to say dichlorate. Someone be, would be able to tell that there are two chlorate ions there because calcium's plus two and chlorate ion has a charge of minus one. This next example, AgBr. Ag is an element in the middle of the periodic table. 
Most compounds that contain a transition metal from the middle of the periodic table, the charges of these transition metals can vary. Because you can have a variety of charges, most of these elements that you see here in the middle have Roman numerals associated with them, like a chromium-2 or chromium-3, copper-1 or copper-2. Silver has a little bit of an oddball exception. Silver always has a charge of plus one, so it doesn't require a Roman numeral. We just write the word silver. Then Br is just one type of element, so we would name this element, but with an ide ending instead. So normally we would call Br bromine, this time we're gonna call it bromide. The examples on the right hand side all contain transition, transition metals. Chromium, copper, iron, titanium, all of these are from the middle portion of the periodic table. They require a little bit more work because we're going to have to tell someone what type of chromium, what type of copper we have. To do this for CR, the name of CR is chromium, but we have to decide is it chromium with a plus two charge or chromium with a plus three charge. To decide that, you're gonna look at the nonmetal portion that you can figure out the charge of. The nonmetal portion is just O, oxide. Well, oxygen in a compound has a charge of minus two. If oxygen has a charge of minus two and there's three of them, the right-hand side of this compound, if we split it down the middle, would have an overall charge of minus six, three negative twos. Well, all compounds are neutral, which means the left-hand side has to have an overall charge of positive six. If there's two chromiums there and we want the total charge to be positive six, if it was chromium Roman numeral two, we'd have two plus twos, that would only equal plus four. It must be the chromium Roman numeral three kind because if we have two plus threes, then it would equal a total charge of positive six. This would be chromium Roman numeral three oxide. Cu2SO4, copper is another transition metal in the middle. The ones in the middle generally require those Roman numerals. Copper can either form positive one or positive two charges. We have to figure out which kind it is. To do that, we're gonna look at the nonmetal portion that we know the charge of. The nonmetal portion is SO4. That's more than one type of element, so we're gonna have to look up what that's called on our charge sheet. SO4 is called sulfate. You can find the charge of sulfate on your charge sheet here. Sulfate has a charge of minus two. So if we split it down the middle, the right-hand side has a charge of negative two. The left-hand side would have to have a charge of positive two to balance that out. If there are two coppers that have to equal a total charge of positive two, we need to decide is this copper Roman numeral one or copper Roman numeral two sulfate? This is copper Roman numeral one sulfate. We have two plus ones that could equal a total of positive two. If it was copper Roman numeral two sulfate, that would be two plus twos for a total charge of positive four. That wouldn't work. So copper Roman numeral one sulfate. The Roman numeral tells you the charge. This guy, this FeO, iron is again in the middle of the periodic table. We're gonna need a Roman numeral to tell us which kind of iron is it? Iron two or iron three? So we know it's iron something. And then the O, O by itself, you take that oxygen and we're gonna turn it into an oxide, one type of element. So we have to decide is this iron Roman numeral two or iron Roman numeral three oxide. Split it down the middle. O by itself would have a charge of minus two. The iron would have to balance that out to be an overall charge of plus two. There's only one of each. So this must be iron Roman numeral two oxide. 
For the Ti3PO42, Ti is titanium, one in the middle of the periodic table. So we're going to need a Roman numeral. If you look on the back of your charge sheet and look for titanium, you're not going to find titanium here. This is a list of common ions, but it's not a list of every ion out there. But because of its location on the periodic table, we can figure out it must need a Roman numeral. We just have to figure out what that would be. So it's titanium something. Now we have this PO4 part. More than one type of element, we need to look up what PO4 is called on our charge sheet. PO4 is called phosphate, and it has a charge of minus 3. Because phosphate has a charge of minus 3, and there's two of them, that means this right-hand side has an overall charge of minus 6. The left-hand side would have to be positive 6. There's three of them that have to equal positive 6 total, so each titanium must have a charge of positive 2. Three positive 2s would equal a total of positive 6. So far, all the examples we've done have been ionic compounds, metals with nonmetals. The covalent ones, we don't have to worry about charges, Roman numerals, nothing like that. We just need to say how many there are of each part. When you're naming a covalent compound, we use prefixes to say how many there are of each part. So this first one, we've got two ends. The prefix for two is di. Then we have to say the element name, di-nitrogen. For the second nonmetal, the second nonmetal in a covalent compound is always going to have an ide ending, just like this bromide or chloride oxide. We just need to put a prefix on there to say how many there are of each type. Five oxygens, we would call that pent oxide. Our last example, S and O. We have sulfur and oxygen. The prefix mono we only use if there's one of the second piece. So we just say sulfur, not monosulfur, but we do put a prefix mono on the second one. So we would call this one sulfur monoxide. To help you remember that weird mono only goes on the second one, you can think of a compound most people know of called carbon monoxide. We don't call it monocarbon monoxide, we just call it carbon monoxide. Or think about carbon dioxide. We don't call that one monocarbon monoxide dioxide. We just put the mono if there's one of the second piece.